Hi and welcome to another Riemann collection video from my new studio. Today I'm gonna show you my analog mastering chain and in the background you can see already my tape machine, the Rebox B77. I don't use it very often, but when I feel like there's a little glue missing in the track when the elements don't come together very well, I send the pre-master through the tape machine to get this special compression and saturation sound. Okay, let's go to the analog mastering chain and I'm gonna show you all the devices one by one. For mastering, it's very important to have good acoustics. So you need to be able to hear all the frequencies in kind of the same volume. And you should have a reverb time called RT60 um, throughout the whole frequency spectrum at around 0.3 to maximum 0.5 seconds. If you want to see what I did to improve the acoustics, check out this video. Also very important is the audio interface where I use the RME Fireface 802 to have a high quality digital to analog and back conversion. Equally important are the monitor speakers to have a flat frequency response. I use the EVE Audio SC4070 to achieve that. Um, they sound perfectly honest. If you want to learn how to master techno tracks like me, check out my masterclass on ribboncollection.com. The link is in the description. So the connector is connected with the audio interface and each device in the mastering chain is also connected to the connector. So it's a lot of connections. But without all the cable mess because there are sub-D connectors at the back. This is the connector software. I can change the order of all the devices. I can mute devices if I want. Um, and there is also a mid-side converter, which I use for the JDK EQ in this, uh, in this case. It's really cool. The first device in the chain is the Manly Massive Passive, which is a tube equalizer. I use it to cut away the very deep bass, if necessary, and to boost and cut certain frequencies which are too dominant or kind of missing. And the Manly does that in a very pleasant, creamy way because of the tubes. Let's have a look on this beautiful device. So that's the Manly Massive Passive. Here's the left channel and here's the right channel. So you need to adjust left and right separately. That's a bit unique to this equalizer, but quite common for mastering equalizers. And the cool thing is um, if you boost something on the right side and not on the left, um, you gain a bit of stereo field, you know, so you can take influence on the stereo field this way. This is the high pass filter, so I use it to reduce um, low rumble, which is not necessary. And sometimes I even cut away the heights above 18 kilohertz, because they're simply not um, needed. It is structured like this. You select the frequency. Um, and the bandwidth, like from narrow to really broad. And you decide if you want to boost or cut. And that's simply the amount. So it's not like this is cut, this is boost. It's you have to decide and then you have to go maximum 20 dB. And you have to select if it's a, sh a bell or a shelf. I mostly go for the bell. Um, because the shelf is, in my opinion, only good for some tricks in the high frequencies to reduce certain frequencies and boost other ones. As soon as I get the main balance of the track right in the manly, the signal goes to the second device in the chain, which is the cream from Tegela Audio. It is a mixture of a Pultex style EQ, but with only the boost function and a mm, SSL bus compressor, I think. You can even change the order, which should come first, the equalizer or the compressor. I always use the compressor first and then the equalizer because the signal comes from the manly equalizer already. I use the compressor part of the cream mainly to cut away unwanted transients. And the equalizer is there to give mostly the 60 Hertz some more energy. If I feel like the bass is too clean in a track, 
I would boost, depending on the frequency, to 30 or 60 hertz. And it adds a lot of overtones to up to 200 hertz. So it gives the bass much more present. Next device in the chain is the SSL Fusion, which is a multi-effect and I only use one or two effects at the same time. Let's have a look. Here's the input trim. I simply make sure it doesn't clip. Um, here's a high-pass filter, which sounds a bit different to the Manley. So if the Manley doesn't sound good or appropriate on something, but I still need a high-pass, I would use this one. And in rare occasions when the whole track needs more overtones and more drive, I use this vintage drive, which sounds very good, but as I said, I only use it if, if necessary because it also adds some noise. This is the EQ section. They call it Violet EQ. It sounds a bit cleaner than the Manley, I think, and I use it mainly to boost frequencies, like the heights above 10K, and sometimes I give 50 Hertz, because that's a nice frequency for techno kicks, but it really depends. And this is a quite unique thing, which is a high frequency compressor. Some people use it as DS, I guess, in vocals, but in mastering for whole tracks, it's nice to fix um, the top end when there is a ride and a hi-hat and the levels are not perfectly matched. I tend to compress only the heights and it kind of glues together this um, frequency spectrum. The stereo imager is nice to broaden the stereo field. Um, I just use it if necessary, of course. And this is a transformer. I always try on and off. If I hear a difference, then um, I use it. If not, I leave it off. It really depends on the loudness of the signal and how many overtones. After the fusion, the signal goes into a tube compressor from Tegel Audio called Schwerkraftmaschine. It adds that magic tube sound to my masterings and it has got a special function called complex multiband. So let's have a look. I always use it in mode 1, which is the complex multiband mode, where it analyzes the control signal in various bands and influences um, the behavior of the tube compressor. I also tend to use a high pass filter on the sidechain signal to avoid a pumping sound. And a really cool function is the wet dry, which is called mix here. So you don't need to have it full on. You can make a parallel compression with 50-50, which I mostly do. This device in the chain is the Magnetismus 2, also from Tegel Audio which is a tape saturation emulation. I mainly use it to drive the already compressed track a bit more and give it some overtones and saturation. A really cool function are the three transformer types, which can influence the top end of a track in a very special way. Let's have a look. I tend to use a low compression ratio here because the track is usually compressed already when it's coming there. Um, and I simply turn on the gain so that the needle hits the zero. Um, and I leave the intensity at quite low because it's too many overtones otherwise. And a really cool function is those three transformer types. Eisen, Iron, Cobalt and Nickel. Nickel leaves a lot of very high frequencies at around 20 kilohertz um, in the track. Eisen Iron is or makes the track a bit more dull, so if the heights are too sharp, I would use iron. And cobalt is somewhere in between. That's a really cool function to influence the top end. And it kind of, I feel like it glues together the top end like above 5k of the track before the signal is going back to the computer for further processing and for the final limiter. Um, the last analog device is the JDK EQ, which I have in mid-side mode. Let's have a look. 
The JDK EQ has got four bands for each channel. I use it in mid-side mode, so the left channel in this case is the mono mid and the second channel is the side signal. So if I want to have a bit more stereo at 1K, I select 1K here and I boost it. So by boosting this, the stereo gets broader. The same with this higher frequency band. And as you can see, the lower frequencies are cut away because you don't need them in the side signal anyways. I mainly use it to give it the final balance in the frequency spectrum. So if I feel like there could be a bit more heights after the, all the compressors, I select the frequency. I tend to boost it a lot and then select the frequency. That's how I find, find out which frequency it should be. And then I reduce it a bit. And yeah, the same with the mids and the bass. With the multiband compressor, I take away unwanted dynamic frequencies like if there's a vocal which sits too loud in the mix, I would catch that with the multiband compressor. I try to leave around 5 dB headroom when I come back to the computer to avoid clipping. Last element in my mastering chain is a digital brick wall limiter where I set the final loudness of the track. If you want to receive content like this about music production every week, subscribe to the channel and see you in the next video.